So where, where did you grow up? I was born in Arkansas, but we moved when I was so young, I don't remember it. And then I uh, grew up in Kansas City, so downtown Kansas City. Okay, so like middle of the country. Yeah, smack dab in the middle. Um, if, if you look at the continental U.S., we're right in the center. Even now, we, we moved on the Missouri side. Kansas City is our home base. Is that why you're so nice? <laughs> yeah, we're from Smallville, and I learned from this guy named Clark. No, uh, <laughs> I, there is kind of a small town attitude here of, of trying to be cordial to one another, but we still have the same amount of jerks. They just <laughs> they just disguise it a little bit differently. Did you find that you had innate talent at a really young age, or did that sort of show up later? Like, how did you discover that you were you? I don't remember a time before I wanted to draw. Um, I remember wanting to stay in from recess, like stay in the classroom whenever I was like in first and second grade to draw He-Man and to draw Superman. Uh, I, that was more fun to me than going out to play. And I usually was you know, one of the better artists in the class, encouraged by the teacher, like, wow, that's really great. Um, but it was where I hit about 13 or 14 years old. All within a couple of months, the following happened. I saw Jim Lee's X-Men number 272 during the Extinction Agenda was what the miniseries was called. Then I saw ElfQuest book three, and that's drawn by Wendy Penny, like in the 70s and 80s. But I discovered this book at a local library. This would have been like in 1989 or something. And then also I met somebody who would become my best friend when I was in high school, a guy named Tyrone Crockett. And he was the best artist in the school. He was a senior when I was a freshman. We would draw together and we would kind of critique each other's work. And I was constantly looking at how he was constructing figures and learning that sort of thing. So it was a big transition period of growth and taking comic books seriously as a career and devote my life to it as opposed to just being interested in it uh, as a consumer or something. I wonder if 14 is a significant age for a lot of other people because like 14 was a really big year for me. You fall into friend groups that reinforce either positive or negative behaviors. You know, what happens if you never find that person? Uh, I would have dealt drugs. I'm not even joking. I've never consumed alcohol or drugs, but I grew up in a... Um, you know, not the greatest area, and we were relatively poor. It felt like dealing drugs would probably be the best <laughs> option to get out of there, in quotes. Um, now, looking back, that would have been a really big mistake. I'm glad we didn't go down that route, um, but I was dangerously close to that. So I graduated high school in 1995, and there was a big downturn in the comic book market around 1994. So there was this huge, what they call the collector's bubble or the speculation bubble that happened where there was like millions and millions of comic books being sold, uh, like X-Men number one, uh, Spider-Man by Todd McFarlane, X-Force number one by Rob Liefeld. All these books sold millions of copies, and that created a speculator bubble where people were investing in the books, hoping that an issue number one of something, maybe if they buy a box of them, then in 20 years, it'll be each copy of those will be worth a grand or 10 grand. Back in the 40s and 50s, comic books were seen just as you would maybe a newspaper or something very disposable. The few that, that survived would end up becoming valuable because everybody else had thrown theirs away or didn't take care of them or something. So then that's an authentic version of scarcity that creates a value in the, the remaining copies. So now there was no scarcity. These really high selling books meant that there was a huge value that was being awarded to the pencilers, to inkers, through royalties and stuff like that. So in 95, I went to a comic book convention and I was showing my portfolio around. And I was showing my work to a guy named Larry Stroman, who drew X Factor and then uh, later drew The Tribe for Image Comics. You know, he was giving me some pointers and then he said, well, it's been kind of hard for even professional artists ever since the, ever since the bubble burst or ever since the market dropped out. Or he said something like that. And... I was like, wait, what do you mean? And he goes, and I remember him looking up from his table <laughs> going, you haven't heard about this? And I said, no. And he basically laid out very quickly what I just communicated to you. And I felt like a total idiot. <laughs> I was like, I have no fallback plan. So during that time, I was working all sorts of of jobs like at Subway and the Turnpike and working maintenance at an amphitheater and just whatever. But during that time, my sister was working at a Goodwill and sometimes people would just drop off magazines they didn't know what to do with. She would just collect them for me and I would go through and like look for reference photos so that I could learn how to draw clothing and stuff because this is at a time basically before the internet. And even if the internet existed, I wouldn't have had a computer. So I was still interested in that as an art form, but I just wasn't sure about the viability of it as something that could sustain me as a career. Comic book art 
was your art. Why is that? Is it because your influences were from the comic world mostly? Potentially. The cartoon of Super Friends and the Christopher Reeve Superman movies, those movies were appealing to me even when I was so young that I I wasn't sure why they might appeal to me. Um, later on, like in retrospect, I, I grew up without a father. And I think that Superman created a like a father figure of like this perfectly powerful, but just and measured individual that would look over things and, you know, make sure you're okay. Um, that was probably part of the appeal. And maybe there's an intimacy when you're reading it similar to a novel or something, but I felt really engrossed with reading Elf Quest a million times, like rereading the same comic book over and over. So let's go back to the, the sort of career timeline. So you've now committed to the idea of being a comic book artist, and then you were given advice that that was a really bad idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, he was like, oh, kid, what are you doing? <laughs> I felt like I had ran as fast as I could, jumped off the ledge of something, and just assumed there would be a ledge not too far down. From that, And then I realized, oh, I'm really actually falling quite a bit. What it felt like what he was telling me is there's a lot of professional comic book artists who are already have established relationships with editors that you're going to be competing against. So it's going to be really hard for you to break in. So what I took that to mean was you should probably just work on your own stuff, whether you have a publisher or not, just keep refining your skills. It was also at a time where I didn't really have the chops to do like a 22 or 30 page story continuously because I could do like maybe a three to five page story but I didn't have the endurance or the the sort of scope or range of the visual storytelling language vocabulary to connect an entire long form story. So there was plenty for me to figure out before I could break in anyway. And if I was working at the turnpike and I oftentimes got the shifts that no one else wanted because I was low on the totem pole, I would bring artwork stuff with me and I would just draw all night because I usually had the 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 really late night or early morning shifts. And it was just a way for me to still learn and do something while I was on the clock and everybody else was either reading or listening to the radio. And then I was just drawing the whole time. So this would have been around the time of like the dot com bubble. I had a friend who had Dreamweaver and uh, Front Page, which are some pretty old uh, web design oh, yeah. programs. My first website was built in Front Page 95. So I, I did some freelance web design um, because basically if somebody hired me freelance, I could do uh, you know original illustrations for them. And then I moved to Texas. Tyrone, when he had graduated from high school, when he went to college, he moved to Texas and he's never moved back to Kansas. His suggestions was that there's more opportunities for freelance web design for graphic art stuff. And at the time, there was a lot of comic book conventions there. And so I called the local convention center. I said, yeah, I was just hoping to get um, like a schedule of the comic book conventions that you know are happening there because uh, we're right outside of Dallas. The guy who I spoke to, <laughs> he said, um, oh, there's not really a lot of comic book conventions anymore. Uh, yeah, I think um, the guy who was organizing them was like embezzling money or something. So there's not really any comic conventions now. <laughs> The comic book organizer that was doing most of these shows had basically been run out of town. So all the wind had been deflated from me for a second time. So before I was working like maintenance jobs and whatever other jobs, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. I just want to point that out for anybody who's listening. It's just not in my you know, preferred career path. And here I was doing freelance web design, making a living, but barely. It would be like occasionally you'd get a thousand dollar check. And that felt like the most money I'd ever had in my life. Uh, and wow. Tyrone was helping out quite a bit as well. Cause he was working for mobile oil at the time. So he had a pretty good paycheck and a steady gig. That wow. Was so good, he but... was a critical part of your life at like various intervals. Oh yeah. Yeah. He, um, Hell of a guy. I remember being in high school, you have like that scene that's kind of cliche where like some jocks come up and start messing with you. And my mentality was we're going to have to physically fight these guys. Instead, he's so funny. He just diffused the situation. He was so much smarter than these guys that he was kind of making fun of them, but in a way that was making them laugh. And he diffused it. They were laughing. And we left almost like a, yeah, yeah, good seeing you type of situation. I had not even thought of that. He just like Ben kenobi the whole thing. <laughs> yes. I very much patterned my, my personality, especially at that time period after him. 